Hey there, my name is James Lee. Thank you for clicking on this video. You're watching my channel 5149 where I talk about business, politics, and society. Okay, per multiple requests, the bolo tie is back. I feel like the bolo tie has gotta be like special occasions only. And today is a special occasion because it is my 50th video. Alrighty, today I wanna talk about the daily political morning show Rising produced by The Hill and hosted by progressive commentator Crystal Ball and conservative commentator and self-described right-wing populist Sagar and Jetty. So last time I made a video highlighting why I thought Rising grew so quickly. At the time they had accumulated around 600,000 subscribers in less than a year and now they're well over a million. Oh my God, that hair was so bad. Anyway, full disclosure, I'm a big fan of the show. I like both Crystal and Sagar, but now that they have over 1 million subscribers, uh, they're pretty big time. So I feel like it's time to make a video that goes even deeper. So over the past several weeks, I've analyzed and categorized over 1,000 segments of the show leading up to the 2020 election, 1,008 to be exact. Anyway, I put myself through that with the goal of answering these two questions. What is rising? Basically, what is the goal of the show? And we're gonna do a deep dive on the content that they put out to see if they're actually staying true to the premise of the show. And then second, what are the criticisms of Rising? Uh, I'm gonna examine whether Rising lives up to the hype that me and many others have put forth by examining the validity of the criticisms levied against the show, and more importantly, discussing whether Rising ultimately contributes positively to our political discourse, or does the show have some kind of other hidden ulterior motive? So alrighty, without further ado, number one, what is Rising? Uh, to answer that, let's dive into what the two co-hosts, Crystal and Sagar, have to say. In an excerpt from their book, The Populist Guide to 2020, they wrote that our goal at Rising is to challenge conventional wisdom and shift both parties to work in the interest of the working class instead of their current financial masters. Sagar, in an interview with the American Conservative, says that it's all about power, and Crystal described Rising in a New York Times interview as a kind of anti-establishment crossfire aimed at hating each other as American people less and hating the elites more. So if I were to sum up what they're saying, it would be this. They are the anti-mainstream media. So if you think about the typical media landscape as it pertains to mainstream media, it's usually based on partisanship, left-leaning or right-leaning, and the narrative is usually left versus right. Now, Rising goes against this by redefining the alignment as anti-establishment versus establishment. So let's dive into the analysis and see how this plays out in terms of the content they put out. About a quarter, 23% of the segments have an anti-establishment left bias. So these could be stories critical of the Democratic Party, like uh, Pelosi melts down live on CNN when pressed on stimulus game playing. Uh, could be critical of Biden. Biden stumbles into embarrassing racial gaffe. Uh, as well as the neoliberal elite, uh, billionaire cries that Dems aren't corporate enough. And they also have a particular disdain for wokeness and cancel culture on the left, uh, like calling out Spotify employees who want to censor Joe Rogan's podcast. As you can see here, they also dedicate a significant portion of the show bashing Trump, but they do it in a slightly different way compared to mainstream media by focusing mostly on his governing and policy failures and not his crude behavior or authoritarian tendencies. Uh, at this point, I think it's important to mention that I did my best to bucket the segments into distinct biases, but a common thread that I noticed is that while many of the stories focus on pointing out the faults of Trump, they also remind viewers of the faults of the Democratic Party, issues with corruption, hypocrisy, things like that. So some might interpret this muted criticism as enabling the far right, but I kind of disagree with that. And, and we'll talk more about that when we get to the criticism section of this video. Okay, so back to this pretty pie graph that I made. Okay, so the next most popular target of Crystal and Sagar is unsurprisingly uh, the liberal mainstream media. And this can be segments critical of their coverage like calling out hypocrisy, or it could be segments making fun of their cringe pandering to the Democratic Party. Next part of the pie chart, you also see that they go after the establishment right quite a bit. Um, and they do this by focusing typically on their economic policy failures like McConnell blocking stimulus, dooming GOP to irrelevant future, or GOP abandons pretense of caring about workers. But also they can't help themselves by devoting a few segments to the clown show that is Trump's posse, like Giuliani caught by Borat in compromising position, or Larry Kudlow makes a fool of himself again on coronavirus. The establishment in general are big targets for Crystal and Sagar, 7%, anti-corporate, that's another 7% of their coverage. And then the small green area, 
We have some pro, like pro progressive left, pro Trump. Um, these are typically not necessarily segments where they're advocating for somebody, but they're bringing on some surrogates or to talk about specific causes that are important to people or the progressive left. And walking through the rest of the chart, you'll see that they also have many segments that I'm categorizing as neutral. Um, I'm counting their many panel discussions, also when Crystal and Sagar kind of debate topics from their point of view. And as always, I appreciate the odd UFO story from time to time, right? There's just so much crap going on in the world and sometimes a few minutes of sci-fi is just what we need. The final thing I wanna point out, and I think it's important to notice this, is that the distribution of biases um, skews towards that anti-something side. So a lot of the show, uh, roughly two thirds of it, is anti-something negative in nature, which shows that they're focusing more on highlighting problems with the system rather than exploring solutions. This is a point I'll come back to later in this video, so just let it you know, percolate in your mind a little bit. But back to the original question posed, overall, I think Rising actually does a good job, a great job in executing on the show's premise. You know, one misconception I hear a lot of is that Rising is fair and balanced or unbiased in their coverage. That's totally not true. They're definitely biased. They have a strong anti-establishment bias as promised. So yeah, based on my analysis, Rising is pretty much what they say it is. It's a very well-produced, well-executed anti-establishment political commentary show. Good job, Crystal and Sagar. Or as Nina Turner more eloquently puts it, Crystal and Sagar call out the role elites of both the Democratic and Republican parties play, including the mainstream media, in propping up a rigged system that ignores the needs of the working poor and the middle class. She says it much better. Anyway, on to the second part of this video, which is examining the criticisms of Rising, for which I think there are a few. Much of the criticism levied onto the show centers on this premise uh, of an article written by Nathan J. Robertson titled, Isn't Right-Wing Populism Just Fascism? And others, like left-wing YouTuber Vosh, has piled on with videos like Crystal Ball and other anti-woke populists enable the far right. And subsequently, you have people on Reddit writing comments like Sagra Anjetti is a crypto-fascist operative ghoul. Others, a little bit more muted in their critique, saying, I like Crystal's radar, often lots of great analysis, but it's getting harder for me to watch the more I think about her role at best as a dupe in a machine that is designed to normalize fascism. And finally, another criticism that I think should definitely be looked into is um, this one that talks about Jimmy Frankenstein. All you need to know about Rising is Jimmy Frankenstein, uh, the owner of the Hill and also a good friend of Trump. That's the dude that signs their paychecks. We're gonna definitely get into all of that and I'm gonna try and fairly assess each of those criticisms by closely examining the data and the evidence. So jumping into the first criticism, which is basically the idea that right-wing populism is just fascism and that Sagar is basically a fascist in hiding. One thing I do have to admit is that I'm not well-versed in political theory, but based on my understanding, the far left and the far right do share some of the same critiques about the system, like the impact of globalization on the working class, but the solutions that they come to are very different. But in this case, I wanna focus on Sagar's position since that's what we're talking about here today. So here's the distribution of biases that I documented for Sagar's radar segment. So overall, while he does have quite a few segments bashing the left, he does spend quite a bit of time also critiquing the Republican Party and Trump. So I'm gonna put that side by side with the 14 points of fascism, which I wanna run through and see how Sagar shakes out in all of this. So point number one, powerful and continuing nationalism. So this is a yes. I, I believe that he has voice support for this kind of clan white nationalist type populism idea. The major candidates on that stage raised their hand to pledge that, pro that health insurance would cover illegal immigrants. If you want to expand the social safety net, you must inherently reduce the size of the population that that is going to apply to. So that's a yes for number one. Number two, disdain for the recognition of human rights. Uh, I'm gonna have to say no, and I'm gonna point to a segment he did on August 11th calling out the use of slave labor in China. A stunning report came out from the New York Times that some of the companies manufacturing face masks, including some of which have been shipped here to the United States, have been caught essentially using Uyghur slave labor. Not a scrap of coverage in the mainstream news. Nothing from Republicans, save for one, Senator Hawley. Nothing from Democrats. Nothing from the White House. Why? because people are making far too much money looking the other way. 
so no on two. Number three, identifications of enemies and scapegoats as a unifying cause. So this one's gonna be a yes for me. I think he's gone after China a number of different times, and so he's pretty anti-China, so I guess that could be interpreted as a unifying force. Number four, supremacy in the military. I'm actually gonna go no on this one because he has denounced foreign wars a lot in his coverage, specifically pointing out this June 23rd segment titled, Bolton's warmongering tax style GOP should never come back. Number five, rampant sexism. This one I'm putting a no as well. I don't think he, I mean, he's definitely anti-woke, but I wouldn't say there's any evidence of him being a sexist, so no on that. Number six, controlled mass media. I don't think this would be the case for Sagar either, as he's dedicated a lot of time on his radar to bashing how the media is protecting elites. Number seven, obsession with national security. Uh, I'm gonna have to go no here as well. Let's take a listen to his July 1st radar segment. Neocons can never help themselves from saying the quiet part out loud. The same, of course, from the Republican Senator Ben Sass, who told Politico that all he wants to see from the White House right now is, quote, their plan for Taliban and GRU agents in body bags. Pause for a moment and consider that. That is a sitting United States senator who says he wants to hear a plan from the White House of the United States for killing Russian intelligence officers on Afghan soil. That is sheer madness. So yeah, not taking the typical hawkish position on national security. Number eight, religion and government are intertwined. I, I don't think so here either. I believe he's pretty secular. I'm not 100% sure of his religious beliefs, but I, I don't think he has one. So I'm going no on number eight. Number nine, corporate power is protected. This one is a definite no for me. He goes after corporations quite a bit. And number 10, labor power is suppressed. This is a, a definite no. He's constantly trying to shift the Republican Party to be more pro-worker. Number 11, disdain for intellectuals and the arts. I'm gonna have to go no here as well. He does have a kind of anti-technocratic point of view, but I don't think he has a huge disdain for smart people and artists at all. Uh, number 12, obsession with crime and punishment. This is a definite yes. Uh, this came up a lot during the George Floyd protests. He's definitely pro-law and order. I'll play a clip here from his June 1st radar. The state's responsibility is to protect its citizens and keep order on their behalf, regardless of what political cause is the justification for violence on the streets. So he's a definite yes on crime and punishment, but I think he's a no on the next one, number 13, which is rampant cronyism and corruption. In cataloging all the segments here, he definitely hits both the left and the right. So no, I don't think he's a big proponent of cronyism or corruption. And then the last one, number 14, fraudulent elections. This one is technically out of the scope from my analysis, but I'll play a recent clip that I found of Sagar responding to Trump's election fraud claims. So look, all I want to do is this. I just want to find uh, 11,780 votes which is one more that we have. Pretty naked, uh, what's going on there. Basically wants to change the results of the election. Uh, and look, we've covered it all here. Signature match is not even possible. It's also not something that has happened. Georgia is actually the most scrutinized electoral results in the entire country because of the recount that happened right. down there. Yes, the whole thing is just completely ridiculous. You can also see that he believes his own bullshit. So in terms of the diagnosis, I don't know if this is like one of those medical situations, the medical tests where you have like, you know, if you have more than an X number of characteristics and you're considered a fascist, something like that. You know, I'm not trying to play defense for Sagar here, uh, but I'm just objectively cataloging what he said. And to me, I think he's explicitly supported some, maybe three or four of these elements. So I think it would be a little disingenuous to call him a crypto fascist. Like I said, I don't know Sagar, so I don't know exactly what's going on in his head. So I can really only judge him based on the segments that he's putting out. And that's just what I see. Moving on to criticisms of Crystal, I'll pull up the comment that I previewed earlier. I like Crystal's radar, often lots of great analysis, uh, but it's getting harder for me to watch the more I think about her role, at best, of being a dupe in a machine that's designed to normalize fascism. Responding to the first part, I think it's true. Uh, lots of great analysis coming from Crystal, especially in you know watching this back, the October 1st segment titled, Trump is as American as apple pie. Watch it, it's pretty good. It's a pretty spot on reflection about America. Now, examining the distribution of her radar segment, she does spend a lot of time criticizing the Democratic Party. 
um, because, I mean, there's a lot to criticize there. I don't think she's doing so to make the case that the Republican Party is better. I think she's doing so because there isn't really a narrative that is easily found in mainstream news like that, like a fair attack of the Democrats. You either get this fawning that you see in the liberal cable news like MSNBC, or you get the Fox News, Newsmax, um, Democrats are radical socialist type BS, and that, that's just not true. So I think if Crystal is able to levy a fair and honest critique about her own party, maybe that will get the voters to reflect on how to fix their party instead of blindly defending them. Jumping back to her radar, I think she devotes a lot of time going after the failures of Trump and the Republicans, albeit once again in a slightly different way than cable news. And also she talks a fair bit here, as you can see, about pro-worker or pro-progressive left issues. Obviously, there's no way for me to really know what's going on behind the scenes, but I think based on my assessment, once again, I think she's pretty fair and honest with her criticisms, which leads me to the third thing I wanna talk about, which is the owner of the Hill. All you need to know about Rising is Jimmy Frankelstein. That's the dude that signs their paychecks. This one's a really interesting one because it's true. The, the Hill is owned by Jimmy Frankelstein, a close friend of Trump. Now, I don't know the editorial process that goes on behind the scenes uh, to produce the show, but it's certainly, yes, it's certainly possible that maybe there is some hidden ulterior motive that's you know trying to con gullible Bernie supporters to the right. So yes, I think there is a bit of credence to this critique because Rising, they talk about the influence of money in politics all the time. So it might be a good idea for them to address this, um, the, the, the issue of the show's funding as it relates to their coverage. But for now, I wanna take a look at the evidence and the segments that they put out to try to um, validate this point or to debunk it. So it looks like they do criticize Trump and Republicans a lot on the show. Once again, in a different way that usually ties their corruption together with the Democratic Party. But like I said, I don't think that's necessarily convincing people that the Republicans are somehow better and that's, that's the answer. Not only that, they provide a platform for many independent voices and journalists. And if we take a look at Rising's most popular guests or friends of the show, as they like to call them, you'll find people like Zed Jelani, who breaks down establishment identity politics, Ryan Grimm, super knowledgeable about the developments of the progressive left, David Sirota, another important voice on the progressive left, uh, Jeff Stein, he covers economic issues affecting Americans, Glenn Greenwald, super interesting segments, as always with Glenn, um, talking about the troubling developments, usually in media censorship, and there's Nina Turner, obviously a progressive champion for racial and economic equality on the left. And to round out this list, Matt Stoller, who talks about corporate power and big tech. Maybe I'm the one being conjured, it's possible. Uh, but if what they're trying to do is convince Bernie or Bus folks to vote for Trump, I don't think they're doing a good job of that. Because if you look at rising on an aggregate level, which I've done, they criticize their own party quite a bit, they bring on independent voices, and they don't engage in conspiracies. So in watching the thousand segments that I've watched leading up to the election, I don't think Rising has converted any disillusioned leftists to vote for Trump. I think what they've done is to make clear that the Democratic Party establishment is corrupt, the Republican establishment is corrupt, the media is corrupt, and the corporations are soulless entities that only care about money. Thinking about this in a different way, let me put my cynical business hat on for a second. Uh, businesses, from how I understand it, they don't have an ideology. They really only care about making money. They look at places, they try to identify places where money can be made. It's kind of like when Jordan said that Republicans also wear shoes. Like, I don't think Jimmy Frankenstein cares about who is in power, who's in the White House. For rising, as long as there is a government to criticize, a media to bash, they don't really care who sits at the top. There's obviously an underserved corner of the market that they're trying to tap into, and I think they have successfully tapped into, the question is, does their anti-establishment narrative help or hurt the political discourse, which is the final thing that I wanna talk about. I've watched a lot of this show, not only in the making of this video, but also in general. And ultimately, I think this is the type of political discourse that's good right now because they challenge people in power, they challenge institutions, they have substantive discussions with their guests, and they try to find commonalities and shared interests among all of us. You know, I don't really buy into this fascist enabling critique because I think the show is doing the opposite. I think it's actually de-radicalizing people and making it possible to have conversations with each other, with people that we don't agree with. Because we have to remember a typical Republican or Democratic voter is very different from a Democrat or Republican in Congress. Those people, in my eyes, are not honest actors. They aren't the audience of the show. The show speaks to Americans who are not in positions of power and the dialogue they have and their ability to respectfully listen to one another and share opinions 
is not an endorsement of fascism, but an effort to, to like I said, de-radicalize and find common ground and push voters to find politicians who are actually honest actors. And right now, I just don't see too many of those people out there. We definitely have one though, that's for sure. Also, remember that thought I had earlier and I said to, to percolate on it? Well, one thing I will say is that Crystal and Sagar, they mostly agree on the problems, the, the core rot in politics, the media, the institutions, but they're not unified on the solutions. And I think for the show to get better, it has to grow beyond just the critique of the system and focus more on substantive discussions to finding workable solutions to the problems they talk about. Referencing again this biases graph that we've gone through a lot in this video, I think they have to expand the proportion of pro segments where they are clearly pushing for a certain solution or exploring a certain idea, and perhaps cut down the proportion of anti-establishment segments that are mainly just criticisms. So anyway, I think the show definitely has more room to grow. And once again, it's not fair and balanced. They have a narrative. The narrative is just different than what you might find in partisan cable news or even other independent outlets that have a clear ideological slant. And I think that difference, that anti-establishment narrative that they're pushing is ultimately a good thing for now. So there you have it, my comprehensive deep dive into rising. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Love to hear what you think. Crystal and Sagar, if you're watching, you've got a pretty big audience, wield it wisely. Um, yeah, it's not inconceivable that they're saying this, right? Both Crystal and Sagar liked my last video, so maybe I'll get lucky again and they'll watch it. But more importantly, if you enjoyed my video, please give it a like, share it, share it with Crystal and Sagar, subscribe. Please hit me up on Twitter, DM me if you have any questions about my analysis or if you want me to send you a spreadsheet. Lastly, I know your time is very valuable and I really appreciate the few minutes that you've been able to spend with me and I will see you next week.